dead. And this is the guy that killed me. Tales from the Crypt, HBO's horror anthology series, where in the original run, almost every episode was based off of a classic EC comic from across their various titles. Some were transferred over almost exactly the same. Well, just a few updates to accommodate the shifting in time period or some padding, because some of them were quite short. Others were radically altered. Either way, it was interesting to see how these tales separated by decades and different horror tropes, how they would end up faring when compared together. Were they stronger or weaker in their new periods? The same, different? Some of EC's horror outings are truly disturbing and some end up leading to concepts that have come back round. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at the story, This'll Kill Ya. We'll take a look at the comic issue first, then the episode, then see how they fare against each other as well as independently. So strap in, this one's about to take you on a ride. The story, This'll Kill Ya, comes from issue 23 of Crime Suspense and Stories. Suspense Stories? Suspense Stories. Which ran from 1950 to 1955. It lasted 27 issues. EC didn't make it long after the code came into effect in 1954, so many of the changes targeted them specifically. This is not being able to use certain words in the title, like horror, but this series years later would all be reprinted. Issue 23 comes to us from 1954, and our tale in question is the first, and is apparently written by, wait for it, you've heard the name before if you've been here a while, Otto Binder. Binder has a reputation for just going hard with certain ideas. <laughs> Whatever strikes his fancy. Superman's a lion? Why not? Supergirl's dating her pet horse who's really a centaur trapped in the body of the horse? Why not? But this story is a really big dark humor streak, so it's interesting to read it from that perspective. We also need to add a little tiny note here if it is Binder. I found it's Binder on several sources, but it's a bit hard to track certain things in the golden age. Well, the episode is later adapted on Tales from the Crypt. The credit goes to publisher William M. Games, who is the crime suspense and stories publisher. He also wrote some of the stories, just putting that out there. It's out there in the ether. The art in this is by Reed Crandall, as are the inks, and the colors are by Marie Severin. Our cover is by George Evans, and it is definitely one that would have been complained about at the hearings, as it featured a woman being murdered in a boat on it. As far as EC covers go, it's pretty tame. It's well done. The emotions really come through, and I really like the inky blackness and ripple details in the water. It elicits a reaction, that's for sure. But the magazine is called Crime Suspense Suspense and stories, suspense stories, suspense. I don't know why, the fact that it's just that end there, it's making me want to pronounce it differently. So much suspense, you can't even get the word out. This story has quite the intro. It was a chill, blustering night at the end of March when Victor Gatling dragged the body into the police station, the body of Joe Endersby, his best friend. Joe Endersby was dead. The two policemen in the station house didn't have to be told that. They could see how his skull was bashed in and how his hair was matted down with thick, dried blood. The desk sergeant and the station clerk stared at the shocking grisly sight, but they were more shocked by the words that Victor Gatling croaked hoarsely. My name is Gatling. Victor Gatling. I've been murdered and I brought my killer. Rather than arresting him on sight, the police need to know what happened. You must be crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm telling you the truth. No matter how not crazy you are, nothing makes you look more unstable than yelling, I'm not crazy. After this, Victor breaks down crying. He says he's gonna die in an hour. That it was Joe that did it to him and he made sure that he got him back first. He says he needs to tell somebody what happened before he dies. Will they listen? Somebody probably ran back to make popcorn. Most night shifts are not this interesting. But we, Joe and I, we worked at the government labs over on the next street, biological labs. We were assigned to a top secret project, very hush hush. We are working on germ warfare. Firstly, fired. Secondly, wow, working on germ warfare. What a bunch of sympathetic protagonists. But first, let me tell you about Joe and me. Joe, my best friend, I thought. We palled around together in college, and afterwards, for the next eight years, we roomed together, ate together, double dated together, and worked together up until last night. So they're getting ready to test the latest iteration of the virus they're working on. They got a mouse all set up. Joe is getting the syringe ready, and while he's doing that, he's going on about how this is going to be Victor's magnum opus. He's going to be recognized by the Pentagon for sure. They're going to kill so many people, beers after work. But then on his way over, he trips, and the syringe just goes right into Victor's arm. Pete Collins and Carl Pratcher rushed across the room from their own lab table staring at me wide-eyed. Good lord, Victor, was that virus Y44 Gamma? I, I slipped, you saw it, it was an accident. The new culture of Black Plague, 10 times more deadly than the germs that wiped out one third of Europe in the Middle Ages. One drop of virus Y44 Gamma is enough to kill an army. 10 cc's of this test solution diluted down 100,000 units is still sufficient to kill a man in 24 hours. Look at this man, his jaws unhinged like a snake. That's how serious this is. Joe absolutely breaks down to the point where Victor feels sorry for him and he's the one who's dying. Joe is just beside himself that he killed his best friend. I pity Joe more and I pitied myself, not knowing how wasted my sympathies were. Poor Joe, I'm facing death, quick, merciful. He's facing a lifetime of torture. Really, dying by something 10 times more deadly than the bubonic plague. 
That doesn't sound like it'll be peaceful or merciful, and you have to wait several hours and you know it's coming. So with no hope in sight, Victor starts walking home. He's just slowly walking, taking in the sights, trying to come to the realization that he's not going to get to experience so many things. He's seeing people out there falling in love, having parties, just living their lives, and eventually he breaks down. No, I don't want to die, not yet. Why must I die? Why did it have to happen this way? Why? But then he comes to a realization. He doesn't want to waste his final hours. He's going to spend them with his favorite person, Joe. It helped, I, I cried it out. After about an hour, I was purged of self-pity. I went on towards home more calmly. Then my footsteps quickened with a new, a wonderful thought. Joe, we'll have fun together. Right up to the last, live it up, up to the end. That's the way, together, like always, helping each other. Joe, Joe. But when he gets home, because they were roommates, Joe is not there. And his things don't appear to be either. And then suddenly the phone rings. He picks it up and it's Joe and he has some things to say. <laughs> Don't give me that best friend routine in this doggy dog society. It's every man for himself, always. You were always getting the credit and the glory, the gravy. I'd move into your spot if you were out of the way and how perfect with all of those bugs jabbed into you all neatly looking like an accident. Unfortunate accident, I tripped Vic. Yeah, on purpose. I murdered you, Vic, and I'm in the clear. Pete and Carl were witnesses. They saw there was nothing but a sheer accident. They'll testify. Bless you, bless you. Understandably, Victor is enraged. This is up there with the top 10 anime betrayal. So now Victor has a new mission. He cannot reconcile the fact that he is going to die and Joe is going to get away with it. He's going to spend his last hours hunting down Joe. He's got 12 hours and he's going to do it. So he's operating on zero sleep and he just starts going out to all the places he thinks maybe Joe could be. He goes to the railway station. He's not there. He's checking local haunts. He's checking restaurants. He's checking bars. And all the time he's just getting more and more distraught. I began to feel feverish. Was it because I'd gone without sleep or was it the plague fever starting? The one that would boil up swiftly consuming me in a fatal fire. It's too late. He won. He's won. He... No, he hasn't won. I can't. I can still spoil his scheme. I'll smash the lab, ruin eight years of work. He'll take my spot all right. Disgrace, incompetence, waste. Crazed at this point, he decides that the least he can do is destroy his legacy. Then Joe will get nothing. We're not going to think about the morality of what they're doing. Don't think about it because this comic doesn't want you to. Or it might actually in a kind of extra layer of dark humor. But for the most part, this is about Joe and Victor. Mostly Victor, but Victor's feelings. When he gets to the lab, he's stunned to see Joe there just working. So he sneaks up behind him and grabs a microscope. And he just lays into him. Joe says, wait, he can explain, but it's too late. Just over and over until his head's pulverized. Until my arms grew weary and the microscope was stained scarlet. And the figure on the floor was deathly still. You killed me, Joe. But you died ahead of me. That helps a little. This leads us to where we came in. The police decided to call an ambulance for Vic, even though he said he's dying. And then they go through Joe's pockets and they find something and they're just horrified. And so they pass it on to Vic. Dear Vic, if you read this letter first, it will mean you came back to the lab to wreck the joint in anger and I've handed it to you. There's another waiting at home too. This explains why you didn't die. I just couldn't resist with our work so grim. We need laughs. Pete and Carl played along, of course. The hypo had plain old distilled water in it, kid. So if you still haven't realized what day it is. I April Fool. It was just a prank, bro. <laughs> Biological germ warfare prank con sexual. What a title. I tried to kill my best friend Brank, 1950s edition. Story's twisted, but I did laugh a little bit at that. This story is really well constructed, though it does have a hurdle that some readers may not be able to overcome. The story in the short time it has does an excellent job of allowing you to travel along this emotional journey with Victor. The use of the first person here really draws you in on this roller coaster ride that Victor is on. From learning that he's dying, to trying to come to accept that, to learning that he's been betrayed, to the rage that comes with that. Part of this is because the story does so well establishing Joe and Victor's friendship, so you feel that betrayal. It's just as upsetting for the reader as it is for Victor. Potentially, if you're connecting with the events. Victor was already in the mindset that what was occurring wasn't fair, but this just made it an absolute injustice. So you can really track how we got from where Victor was at the start of the story to where he is at the end. The idea of this being a prank is pretty over the top, but not that over the top, even though for dark humor, yeah, it's a bit beyond the pale. Like yes, morticians, nurses, lawyers, insurance folk all have kind of darkest senses of humor, but this is a lot of a lot. But in a way that adds to the story, Joe is supposed to be Victor's best friend and he pulls this on him. This is not funny. You can't mess with people like this. It's not a guarantee that they're gonna smash you over the head with a microscope, but you're certainly increasing the odds. In my opinion, even if Victor hadn't killed him, this would have permanently damaged their friendship. The trust, how could you believe anything? What is this elaborate hoax and all your co 
coworkers are in on it? Why? So in a way, that makes the ending sadder. We saw how Victor just wanted to spend his last hours with his best friend, Joe. He thought so highly of him. So not only has he killed him, but he has to now reconcile that Joe would do this to him. It's a double whammy. But I also hate pranks, so I'm a bit predisposed to be on Victor's side of this. It's not just a prank, bro. It's cruel and hurtful. <laughs> the thing is, there is that element looming over the story that these are scientists engaged in biological warfare, and that may make it difficult for some to care at all about Joe and Victor's plight. Oh, boo-hoo. Gone before they could perfect a deadlier version of the plague. Although, again, their profession could be part of the joke, like this kind of meta layer of joke of, oh, well, nothing was lost. This joke may have layers, or I may be reading too much into it. I probably am. Whether I am or not, though, this is a strong story. It builds up well, has a solid and twisty payoff, as these comics enjoyed, and leaves you feeling something. Be it uncomfortable, amused, unsympathetic. That ending, it's a gut punch. Happy April Fools! So overall, this story has some strong moments to pull from, so it's understandable why it would have been one of the stories chosen to be adapted on Tales from the Crypt. So let's see how this fares on television in 1992. In season four, episode three is outing the same name. This was written slash adapted by A.L. Katz and Gilbert Adler. It was directed by Robert Longo. We have our usual opening by the Crypt Keeper and a custom cover for the story, more in keeping with this version, but still in that EC classic style. The opening is the same, but rather than narration, we have a much more evocative and visceral sequence. We see our protagonist, this time named Zero Gatlin, rather than Victor Gatling, dragging a corpse from the boot of its car to the police station. And it's really brutal. All the things that they describe in that narration box, they show. So you see the blood trail, you hear him being dragged across the ground, you see the difficulty of how much effort he's having to put into pulling him, how his head's banging on the steps as he's coming up because he's just dead weight. And Dylan McDermott, who plays George, just goes hard from the start. You see, I'm dead already. Everybody in this is gonna have so much scenery. Scenery for all. With that police station cold open out of the way, now it's time to flash back. So when we get back to the past, we spend a lot of time establishing that George is a jerk. He's fast talking and he's sleazy. He's gone on again, off again thing going with one of the lab workers, Sophie, and has a fraught relationship with her coworker, Pac Brightman, whose name he always over enunciates. Let me, let me tell you something, Professor Brightman. George is diabetic and he keeps his insulin on the same shelf where they keep the material that they're working on. The highly dangerous material, cause he's not the brightest. He also regularly has Sophie give him his injections instead of doing them himself because it's established that he has a fear of needles. That's not in her job description. Uh, I hate needles besides. I love the thought of a beautiful woman causing me intense physical pain. If only that were the case. So now rather than working in germ warfare, they're working to end all disease, all of it. So George Gatlin asserted that he and his partners Pac Brightman and Sophie Wagner have developed a hybrid cell that will revolutionize the treatment of disease by breeding the disease out of it. Yeah, that cell does something. Now the main conflict between the group is as follows. George is too aggressive by announcing their progress and giving press conferences and the like. He's making it sound like their findings are much further along than they are, that they're ready for human trials and all kinds of things. He's putting a lot of pressure on the team and they don't like it. His side of the argument is that he feels that he needs to be the one to go out there and drum up funding and that people won't want to fund their project if they don't feel that's moving forward at all. However, this episode is not constructed to make you see George's side. He's presented as a raging jerk with lots of resentment towards the team, especially Pac. And if I have to do certain things to maintain that profile for you, then you had better keep your big mouth shut. You're out of your friggin' mind. I'm out of here. He also has a predatory relationship with Sophie. You know what, you can take your integrity and you can shove it up your you love to see your name in the papers. And don't tell me that's not true. You and me, we should go back to your place tonight. What do you think? Right now, the idea of being intimate with you makes me sick. It just comes across like she wants nothing to do with him and like he's harassing her at every turn. It's meant to be that she's playing hard to get, but that's not how it comes across. For some reason, George just has access to Sophie's apartment because he lets himself in and this scene is poorly constructed for what they're going for because he comes across so rapey in it. Get out. What? We have to do this dance every time. Out! I'm not dancing, George. This is not hot, but it's meant to be a lead up to them having hate sex. The way they manage to switch into something feeling a bit more consensual is that they put her on top, so it changes that she goes on top of him because before that he was just pinning her and if that was the case and she'd acquiesced, it could have really been read as she was just doing that to make sure that she'd stay safe because he was being so aggressive. I mean, he just showed up in her house after she already told him no, 
physically overpowered her. But then the show pulls the, no wait, this is actually incredibly hot, even though there's nothing he's saying that warrants that. They at least add a line that she gave him a key and she wonders why she ever did that, but why did she let him keep it? Change the locks, girl, this is unhealthy. You be nostalgic, baby. Huh? Young flesh. You were thinking how nice it would be. He's gross after they do it too. I hate to eat and run, but I got some work to do down to the lab. What a gentleman. I can't wait to feel bad for him when he's injected with some kind of toxic substance. Oh wait, I won't. The next day, George tries to make up with Pac because Sophie asked him to. He is shown to have some kind of feeling for Sophie, that she's the person who brings out a bit of the best in him. After he does this, bringing Pac an empty cup of coffee, because you can tell because of how he's holding it, he asks for his usual insulin assistance. Sophie injects him, but not before saying an ominous, I'll be perfectly happy to stick it to him. But George screams at her to stop because he grabbed the wrong vial. It's the H cell, the cell that will cure things or alternatively fill your body full of tumors. That's why we were so pissed off with you yesterday. Once we start the H cell process, we cannot stop it. Fight, 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 stop, turn it off. The injection gets to work quickly. The site's all inflamed and veiny. It's swelling up. He's hallucinating. He's sweating. Knees are weak. Palms are sweaty. He's just out of it. Pac says that he's trying to find an antidote, but they're not finding anything that will work. That they were six months away. They told him so. So George runs off and wanders for a bit as he's assaulted by choppy 90s horror editing. He ends up at the local bar, which is one that him and his colleagues frequent. There he learns from the bartender that Sophie and Pac were in there earlier and that they appeared to be celebrating something. He compiles this together in his already addled mind with the fact that he was trying to call Sophie and couldn't get a hold of her. So in his disoriented state, he's starting to try and put some things together. So he goes to Sophie's house and there he overhears a call on her answering machine. I'm still feeling guilty as hell about George. With his insulin and all. I'm not saying you weren't right. I think it had to be done, but... Call me, okay? I better yet, why don't you meet me at the lab? So he figures they're trying to take him out. So he goes to the lab, and this time instead of a microscope, we have a baseball bat. And this scene goes hard. I still wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to show it. If you're seeing it, it's because YouTube said yes. <laughs> the sound effect as the bat connects with Pac's head. You also have the one where he injects him directly into the heart and his heart explodes. Who can play the insulin game? <laughs> Oof, just that's a lot. Brava. So we're back at the opening now, and Sophie arrives at the police station and she screams at George, there's something wrong with him. They just doctored his insulin to teach him a lesson. What are you what are you talking about? What what are you, what are you saying? We're trying to teach you a lesson to give you a better attitude before we told you the good news. For Christ's sake, George! Actually, they were celebrating because they solved the eight cell problem. It works now. Womp womp. It's not April Fool's, but it was still kind of just a prank, bro. But less of a prank, a lesson. Poor Pac, he was the most likable character. He was played by Cleveland Little, and this was his last acting performance. This episode is very much in the groove of the schlocky horror vibe with hard R elements where Tales of the Crypt made its home. The emphasis is more on that ironic twist on character development, and it does well to lead up to that. The story does a good job of presenting the concept that George really could have been injected with the eight cell, as silly as it made him seem keeping his insulin there. The characters have poor relationships, so you can buy that they would want to kill him, or that it was an accident. But on the whole, it falls down a little bit, because it's very hard to feel sympathetic towards George. And that's saying something, because his my counterpart was trying to make the bubonic plague more deadly. But that felt more abstract because in the story itself, Victor was presented as a nice person that was kind of happening in the background. Here you get to spend a lot of time seeing that George just jerk, but the co-workers are not of the highest caliber in either version. Some of us care about our integrity, you know? But not enough to not poison a man to teach him a lesson. So at this point, since I already started doing it a little, let's start comparing the two outings. The change in profession makes sense. It's hard to emphasize with biological warfare than with scientists trying to cure all disease. They're a two-person team. But this television adaptation may do too much padding. We spend most of the episodes setting up that George is an unlikable jerk before he's injected at 15 minutes in, which is over half the episode, because one has to remember they also had to have space for ad breaks, so that takes it down to 26. But then also you have to take away the intro and outro with the Crypt Keeper and also the credits. So 
most of this is dedicated to look at George. Why won't he let them do their research properly? As a result, there isn't much breathing room given to him after he's injected to go from accepting his death to murdering Pac. One of the episode's strengths is you do see George getting sicker. So there's a bit more pressure on the whole he's dying element. But on the other hand, we see him hallucinating, so we know he's not in his right mind. Whereas in the comic, we see that descent to desperation that Victor is driven to. Each version leaves them addled, but Victor's leaves him a bit more in control of his actions overall. The comic tries to get you into Victor's headspace, maybe even get you to a, yeah, he had it coming, so the reader can be as surprised as Victor at the end. The relationships on Tales from the Crypt are so fraught in the episode that it's not shocking that they did this to him. And it wouldn't have been if they actually killed him either. So in the comic, the best friend relationship is utilized to a bit stronger an effect for both reveals. George's anger in the episode also feels misdirected. It was Sophie who injected him, and based on that telephone message was also the mastermind behind the plan. It was Sophie he was sleeping with. It feels like if they were going for maximum emotional impact, since some part of him did like her and did try and do a bit better for her, and it was presented that for some reason she kind of liked him a little bit, then he should have killed her and Pac should have been the one bursting into the police station. The way the episode plays out feels familiar. It's very much your standard anthology ending of the time. See, if he'd had more chill, things would have worked out differently, but they didn't work out because this was the Outer Limits slash Tales from the Crypt slash all the other anthologies from the time. Also, side note, this is just me. I get a very visceral reaction to them messing with his medication, messing with his insulin. Because the rationale is that at the end of the day, he was right, and they did figure out a solution to their problem in the time frame he pitched, and they didn't want him to have a big head. Some of us care about our integrity, you know? The Sophie scenes felt gratuitous, because ultimately their sexual relationship didn't factor into anything going on, and it took away from time that could have been used to really hammer home that paranoia and confusion of was it an accident, or did they do it on purpose? Building up to that reveal that it wasn't the 8 cell at all. But instead we got boobs. Boobs I had to hide, because YouTube isn't here for that. Man getting smacked in the head with a baseball bat? Yes. Boobs? No. Despite having a very abrupt, it was just a prank April Fool's ending, the 1950s story has more going on psychologically, and works well as a psychological horror piece. The adaptation does have its moments, from the sleazy potential of vengeance, to flirting ever so briefly with being body horror, but it doesn't fully commit to any one thing. Leaving you with a fairly standard episode for the time, which is a solid outing. Uh oh, the police are coming. They're coming for George. <laughs> wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. It definitely takes advantage of the medium though. Some of the things you do there you just can't do in the comics. Just let's hear that heart explode again. But those are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Do you disagree? Think the adaptation is the stronger of the two? Think it actually has some deep character work going on? Do you love both for different reasons? Hate both for different reasons? Meh. Do you like pranks? Was this prank a step too far in either version? Any other Tales from the Crypt episodes you'd like to see compared this way? Let me know down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time every day to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.